Thanks for the opportunity to talk about coherent elastic neutrino nuclear scattering. The community calls it sevens in short, where neutrino is replaced by the Greek letter nu or English letter v for easy typing and pronunciation. Big thanks to the community for their support in the preparation of this presentation. A neutrino can interact with a nucleus in many ways. When its energy is very small, the interaction becomes non-destructive. The nucleus is simply pushed a little bit by the instant neutrino. In this type of interaction, all nucleons in the nucleus interact as a whole, hence coherent in the name. Since Z boson is the mediator, it is a weak neutral current interaction, which was predicted nearly 50 years ago. The differential cross-section of sevens as a function of nuclear recoil energy can be calculated using the standard model. Obviously, it also depends on the instant neutrino energy. When the momentum transfer is too large, the neutrinos start to see individual nucleons in the nucleus, and the interaction starts to lose its coherent nature. This effect is included in a term called nuclear form factor. The two parameters, GV and GA, can be calculated based on the numbers of protons and neutrons in the nucleus. The axial coupling is rather small since the influence of spin-up and spin-down nucleons cancel out each other. The dominant contribution to the vector coupling comes from the number of neutrons. Turn the equation to plot, we can draw the cross-section as a function of the instant neutrino energy. Compared to new E or neutrino nuclear charge current interaction, the sevens cross section is about 100 or even 1000 times larger. The cross section also becomes larger when the neutrino energy becomes larger. However, when the energy is too high, the form factor starts to decrease to account for the loss of coherence. A few tens of MeV is about the sweet spot. Now let's talk about the bad side. If you use a tiny ball, to hit a huge ball, the kinetic energy that the huge ball can obtain is just tiny. Take germanium nucleus as an example. The highest energy it can gain from a 30 MeV neutrino is just about 25 keV. To make things worse, most of this energy is released as heat and not detectable. All these make it very hard to detect sevens experimentally. That's why sevens was only observed recently by the coherent collaboration at the spallation neutron source in the Oak Ridge National Lab, where a proton beam strikes a mercury target, generates a lot of pions and muons, which decay at rest into neutrinos. A small cesium ion detector observed sevens in 2017, and this year we published the result of observing sevens in a small liquid argon detector. But why bother? Sevens is a standard model interaction. Does it worth the effort? It turns out that sevens is a perfect probe to study various physics. Due to the time limit, I will just mention a few. Please check these references for detailed review. First, it can be used to measure the nuclear size. This was traditionally done using electron nuclear scattering, which is sensitive to proton distribution only. As we learned before, neutrons in the nucleus contribute most to the sevens cross-section. That's why sevens can be used to probe the neutron distribution in the nucleus. Second, if the scattering is mediated by some non-standard model particle, the cross-section can be scaled up and down by a few non-standard neutrino interaction parameters, or NSI parameters. If we plot the cross-section as a function of two NSI parameters, at some of the parameter spaces, the cross-section is enhanced. At some other places, it is suppressed. The precise measurement of sevens cross-section would tell us something about the NSI. Another interesting fact is that sevens happen for all neutrino flavors. That's why it is insensitive to oscillations between known flavors. A change deficit of sevens at different distances from a neutrino source indicates the oscillations of known flavors to or from a stereo neutrino. 
Neutrinos from the universe can coherently interact with dark matter detectors and become a background for dark matter experiments. Would better understand it precisely. More interestingly, if dark matter particles interact with normal matter through a new force mediator, the dark matter particle parameter space can be dramatically enlarged. If the dark matter particle is very light, they can be created in accelerators. For example, a proton beam hitting a target may generate this new force carrier, which decays into a pair of dark matter particles. One of them can be detected by a seventh detector nearby. The detection technology is exactly the same, and the seventh is the dominant background of such a search. Due to its importance, seventh detection has become a global effort. We can categorize them based on the origin of neutrinos. There are mainly three artificial neutrino sources, accelerators, reactors, and radioactive sources. As the neutrino energy goes up, the maximum nuclear recoil energy also goes up. That's why to detect neutrinos coming out of a spiralization neutron source, only conventional dark matter detectors are needed. While for the detection of reactor neutrinos, new technologies are needed. This plot compares various accelerator-based neutrino sources. The x-axis is the power of a proton beam. The higher the power, the better, since more neutrinos can be created. The y-axis is the background rejection factor. Basically, it is how narrow the beam pulse is in unit time. The narrower, the better, since the less random background can get into the signal window. Based on these two considerations, the spallation neutron source in the Oak Ridge National Lab is a very good choice. That's why the coherent collaboration chose to put various detectors around the spallation neutron source, which has a very powerful beam and very narrow beam pulses. Another advantage of coherent is its deployment of multiple targets, which allows a systematic check of sevens in a wide mass range. Click this link, you can take a virtual tour of Neutrino Alley, a narrow pathway hosting all coherent detectors. A recent news from the collaboration is the observation of sevens in a small liquid argon detector. Nuclear recoils can create scintillation light in liquid argon, which can be detected by two photomultiplier tubes, one up and one down. We compared the observation with the calculated cross-section and placed very strong constraints on the NSI parameter space. We accumulated a lot more 7th event in the CSI detector and significantly reduced some systematic uncertainties. Now, the largest uncertainty comes from the neutrino flux from the source. That's why we are in the design and the construction of a heavy water detector to measure the neutrino flux in situ. The liquid argon detector will be enlarged. Cesamidite is retired. A large hyperi domain detector array and a large sodium ion detector array are under construction. With so many sevens detected, we can also check if there is any room for dark matter created from the same source. Our sensitivity to dark matter normal matter coupling strength as a function of dark matter mass has gone beyond existing constraints in a wide mass range. A similar detector is a 10-ton liquid argon detector at the Los Alamos Neutron Science Center. Compared to the SNS, the beam is less powerful, but the pulses are much narrower, which offers an excellent ambient background rejection. Another advantage is the large experimental hall that can host big detectors. The light collective efficiency is relatively low due to its large size. It is possible to put two identical detectors in the hall, perfect for stereo neutrino search. The detector hasn't found sevens yet, but it can already set very nice constraints on the accelerator-based dark matter parameters. The last stopped pion source I'd like to mention is the European Spallation source. Compared to the SNS, it has a more powerful beam, but less narrow pulses. The idea is to add a neutrino facility on top of the ESS neutron one, which is called a neutrino superbeam. 
which include an accumulator to compress the white proton pulses. It also provides underground near and far detectors for neutrino oscillations. It is also possible to provide a muon beam for muon collider. Various detector systems are proposed for the detection of sevens at ESS. An interesting idea is a gaseous noble gas detector, which can be run at room temperature. It is much less dense than a liquid detector, but works just fine at ESS due to the high neutrino flux. Unlike a liquid, gaseous detectors can observe all deposit energies. The created charge carriers will be drifted to a high field region to create a lot of scintillation light. This way, it can be sensitive to a single electron created by a tiny nuclear recoil. The reactor-based sevens experiments are as diverse as the accelerator-based ones. As we mentioned before, the low neutrino energy results in very low nuclear recoil energy. Low threshold detectors are the key for their success. Another disadvantage compared to the accelerator-based neutrino sources is the continuous running core. We cannot use time coincident to reduce background. Shielding has become very important for these experiments. Many new technologies are used to reduce energy thresholds. I'll try to compare some of them based on the used technologies. But before we talk about the detectors, let's compare their sides first. The higher the neutrino flux, the better, and the thicker the overburden, the less the cosmic array contamination. Let's start with ionization detectors. Three experiments chose to use high purity domain detectors. Compared to the regular high purity domain detector, these detectors feature a very small contact, which results in a tiny capacitance with a large detector volume. The tiny capacitance results in very small electronic noise, hence lower energy threshold. Another common technology is to use mechanical cooling, which is maintenance-free and can provide active vibration reduction, hence even lower noise. The former two experiments have multiple layers of lead, copper, and polyethylene. The last one used scintillation crystals to provide active veto. Two of them published their observed spectrum this year. They are very close to the observation of sevens. With the existing data, one of them can already set constraints on non-standard neutrino interaction and dark matter. The second ionization detector I'd like to mention is CCD, charge coupled device, which is basically pixelized silicon wafer. It offers much lower energy threshold than germanium, and also the capacity to do particle identification based on shapes of particle trajectories. Since it is made of vapor, it is very hard to be made as big as germanium detectors. Eight thick CCDs are used in a Coney experiment, which published their energy spectrum in 2019. They are also very close to the observation of sevens. Based on the observed data, they can also set constraints on low mass dark matter parameters. An interesting technology they are developing right now can repeatedly sample the same pixel to average out noise. This allows them to detect single electrons. However, due to the repetitive sampling of the same pixel, the detector is very slow. The last ionization detector is liquid xenon-based. Charge carriers created by nuclear recoils will be extracted from liquid xenon to gas xenon to create scintillation light in the gas phase. One electron can create about 30 photoelectrons. It is both dense and sensitive to single electrons. But the problem is the random emission of electrons trapped in different places in the detector. Now let's talk about heat detectors. They detect the phonons created by nuclear recoils. This allows them to see much lower energies. But to keep a reasonable energy resolution, the crystal must be kept very small. Minor is an exception. This is because they actually detect charge signals through phonons created by those charge carriers in the high field region of their detector. Strictly speaking, they're ionization detectors. Another interesting fact about minor is that they have a moving reactor core, which is ideal for stereo neutrino search. 
Ricochet also detect both ionization and heat signals. They can do particle identification based on the ratio of the ionization and heat signals. Nucleus has a really interesting idea of instrument their crystal holding structures for the detection of backgrounds. Finally, let's talk about a scintillator-based experiment, NEON, which is a combination of cosine, a dark matter experiment, and NEOS, a stereo neutrino experiment. They utilize very short sodium iodide crystal to increase the light collector efficiency, which results in a very low energy threshold. They also use liquid scintillator as active shielding. Here shows the timeline of 7th development. It may not be up to date, however, it demonstrates the community effort and a big picture of the future of 7th. If you want to learn more about 7th, I'd like to draw your attention to an annual meeting, Magnificent 7th, held around the same time as PIC. This year, the meeting will be online. You are welcome to join the discussion. Thank you.